Today's episode of the ICA Health and Wellness Committee uh, will be with uh, Dr. Robert E. Markison, a um, hand surgeon um, who is with us from San Francisco today, and we'll be talking about repetitive um, hand injuries, his niche and specialties. Um, Dr. Markison, thank you for accepting the invitation, and uh, I'm grateful that Rebecca Rushin from Ohio is with us as well to co um, author uh, this uh, episode. Um, let me just introduce him a little bit um, to the membership or to the listeners. Uh, Dr. Markison um, is a, a clinical professor of surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, a faculty member of the San Francisco Orthopedic uh, Residency Program, and a lifetime member of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. Um, He's also a board a certified hand surgeon in San Francisco, California, and has now given more than 100 patients relief from carpal tunnel syndrome with carpal tunnel release, CTR, using a, a special SX1 micronife and ultrasound guidance. Dr. Markison is also a professional musician, artist, and craftsman specializing in the care of creative hands. He is a co-founder of the UCSF Health Program for Performing Artists that was founded in 1984. He performs a variety of instruments, including um, recorder, brass, string, saxophone, piano, clarinet, different reeds, electronic, and a variety of other instruments. Um, these, some of these recordings have been um, online for the time, so anyone can listen to that on YouTube or might be other platforms as well. I'm so thrilled to be with you here, Dr. Markison and Chaba. Um, Dr. Markison, um, I am so impressed with not only your medical career, but your musical career. Um, you play so many different instruments. I've watched your videos, you know, where you play clarinet, bass clarinet, saxophone, the brass instruments, recorder, harmonica. And I'm just wondering what came first, your interest in music or your interest in medicine? Uh, the simple answer is I see medicine as time and space because everybody wants, I want to know how long has it been going on and they do too. That's time. Music is the graceful measure of time. As far as art and craft are concerned, that's the graceful measure of space. And since I understood relativity well enough to know that it was a time-space continuum, I wanted to be able to measure graceful time, music, graceful space, art, before venturing beneath the skin to try and help people out. And so the, the first adventures were parallel time-space adventures, meaning musical time, artistic space, with craft uniting the two. And then I figured, okay, I may be worthy of studying medicine. And then at that, what would be the most interesting little story, the hand, and big story, the human story of 200,000 years of homo sapienhood. And could I get into the little story, not just that fabulous mechanism, but also the fossil record, including pre-human ancestors to understand the whole picture in case, for example, I'd have to reconstruct an injured modern hand and go back to the simpler hand. So it was a broad sweep that I was interested in. Little story, big story, and then the the stuff that is the blue, the really the firmament, and that's the arts. That's so fascinating. Um, how do you find time to do everything you do, uh, all your music making and and craftsmanship with your very, very busy career as a hand surgeon and specialist in repetitive strain injuries? I guess the making of a surgeon and the winnowing process therein is all about can you go with a few hours or one hour of sleep? Can you, can you do a little bit of brain control so that you're not asleep, you're not awake, but you're dreaming and you're still active and functional? And so go down, go up without any trouble in between. And so I learned to uh, live on small parcels of restorative sleep. Wow, that's very impressive. 
I had uh, actually my childhood, well, not childhood, when I was in conservatory back in Hungary, uh, I had a, a, a professor that suggested me to take a 20 minutes uh, break in which I lay down on a bed and relax. And it really regenerates the body if I hit that alpha state. And I did that many times because we had a really, really rigorous um, um, in the morning and, and after an evening class schedule. And it helped me so much. So a little bit dig of where you're coming from with that. Uh, no, they're absolutely related. I mean, we're tacit, as you know. Sometimes you're tacit, eight bars, 64 bars. And that's what the brain wants, cycles of action and repose. Absolutely. Um, the Dr. Markison, what type of surgery do you do for repetitive strain injuries? <clears throat> I a little bit mentioned uh, that you use ultrasound guide, uh, guidance and, and, and micro knife. Uh, can you tell, tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, sure. Yeah, so the concept is, especially in musical hands that might have contact surfaces anywhere, the idea is to avoid large incisions. So for example, let's see. Something like that or less is perfectly adequate for carpal tunnel release. You go in, you release any tight bands of tissue, put a little probe in, ultrasound guided, beneath the roof of the carpal tunnel, which is here. So now you've got this tunnel going across the hand. You've got the nerve. You avoid the nerve. You put a little probe in next door to it. You remove that, put in a little device, which has a tiny micro knife, inflate balloons that stride the cutting portion, deploy the blade from inside out, very carefully avoiding any sensory nerve tissue crisscrossing there, and you're done. So 15 minutes later, and a person may have had 15 years of numbness and tingling, you're ahead of the game. Part of the resolution of carpal tunnel syndrome is releasing the mechanical constriction. The other part is the nerve, if injured, has to regrow its insulation. And that can be taking weeks and months, but there's an immediate blush with a better night's sleep and steady improvement. So it's, it's, it's I don't have any financial piece of any of the instrumentation I use, but I'm going microinvasive with good results long term, and I've followed my carpal tunnel releases for a long time. Very mm -hmm. nice. Uh, do you use uh, local anesthesia to do these surgeries, or uh, do you put people to sleep? No, it's local anesthesia. It's outpatient surgery, and they can drive in and drive out if they want. Yesterday, I operated on a machinist uh, who needed both sides done, and he drove in and he drove out. Absolutely nice. Wow. So he could even drive out after the surgery. Oh, sure. No, two hours. Yeah, two hours each way. Sure. Yes. No problem. What is what is the recovery time after the surgery in general? Well, after carpal tunnel release with an ultrasound guided microinvasive approach, they're on to light manipulative use within a day or two and then graduate up to normal use, usually within a couple of weeks. I see. That is That is absolutely amazing. I never heard anything like that. Uh, besides your technique. Um, do we use any uh, painkillers or any other medication after the surgery for a time? Uh, sometimes they need one or two Tylenol, and that, that's usually about it. Some of the off-the-shelf stuff, never any narcotics needed for that. Very good. You mentioned that um, you had some patients that might have had 15 years of carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, with this uh, precision, um, does it make any difference that someone had the ailment for five months or 15 years? Yes and no. If they've had had the trouble of sensory loss, and again, going back, classic carpal tunnel syndrome, numbness, tingling, thumb, index, middle, and this half of the ring finger, which may awaken you from sleep at night and may persist through the day, that's sensory. But there's also a muscle branch here and a couple little muscle branches there. If you have wasting or atrophy of this muscle wad, then that's problematic and you may not get it back because the clock stick ticks for about 12 to 18 months before the neuromuscular junction dies away. So you may not retrieve that. So there's some urgency about getting to motor muscle in addition to sensory carpal tunnel syndrome. 
once you start to get atrophy, you have to go, go, go. As far as sensory symptoms that are tolerable and not in a, a, a crescendo, um, then you can, you can wait a little bit. I've had to temporize on a number of musicians who've had to wait literally years uh, for one reason or another, and then got it done, which they'd gotten it done 10 years earlier, but they did well. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Dr. Markison, I know you spoke on your um, some of your videos about how you modified your own clarinet um, mm -hmm. to um, adequately um, help with personal ergonomics with the right pinky keys. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and who who you would recommend to do this. Well, yeah, I, I got very interested in, my dad was a machinist uh, in the Pacific Theater of World War II, ran a machine shop on a battleship repair ship. So he taught me all the machining and then I subsequently taught myself all, all about metals and metal casting. So this, for example, is sterling. This is just a standard gold band. But to be able to work metals, initially I went to low melt, low melting temperature magnesium alloys as prototypes. And then, uh, and this isn't the instrument, but you know that four key cluster, you're somewhere between left and right little fingers. But I had to make these smaller because I have what about 35, 40% of people actually have, which is poor independence of the little finger. If I hold them straight and your audience could do the same and I try to bend it, it doesn't do much. It likes to work with my ring finger and it likes to work with my middle. Now contrast this on my right dominant hand with this on my left. So no two hands and no two people are created equal and there's no promise of side to side symmetry. So to avoid, to avoid exploiting the interconnections between ring and little fingers, I had to scale the keys down by about 75%. Again, prototyping through low melt magnesium and then uh, pewter and then nickel and then silver plated the nickel and then I was home because I could make this travel a little bit instead of a lot. As my hands grew the problem was less of a problem but as you know a violinist doesn't start on a full-size violinist at age four six or eight and so size size is important it's about rightness of fit to avoid failure. Mm -hmm. And do you, are there any, um, are most instrument repair technicians able to do this or do people really need to seek um, someone more specialized to do those kinds of adjustments? Well, start with one and that person should have a, a network of referrals to send you somewhere else. If, if they can do things like this and key extensions and move keys around without hindering sound, fine. I mean, I've had patients recently with somewhat debilitating arthritis, so they needed platform key clarinets, so in like a closed hole flute. And they're not as muffled as you might expect, and the intonation's good, you can't get them just anywhere, but they're closed. You have the holes, but you have closed platforms. And so a lot of my patients have had either alternative interfaces, meaning musical instruments that they can use comfortably, then they can go to the real thing or not. It's again, like the closed or open hole flute. But yes, if you have a good repair person, then he or she should be able to refer you somewhere. Who, who knows where in the world? I wish I knew because a lot of the masters and sages of this have retired. I've done my own work, but I really cannot offer it publicly, locally or internationally anymore. Do you do your own instrument repair as well? Yeah, I do. Okay, great. Yeah, that's super. Well, I make, I make stuff. I mean, Anthony Giliotti, the, the former principal clarinetist of the Philadelphia Symphony, gave me the recipe a few decades ago for barrels, for example. And so tur lathe turning my own barrels is a wonderful thing, because as you know, mouthpieces matter, but barrels matter at least as much. I, I didn't turn this bell, but I also turned my bells. And somewhere between barrel and bell, you can be very happy. I'm lucky to live near Clark Phobes, who's the master mouthpiece maker. But this one, this one here is Eddie Daniels. Uh, Portnoy made a lot of mouthpieces for me when he was going strong. That is great. <laughs> um, I'm a friend of Clark Phobes as well. He's great. Yeah. Genius. Genius. Um, 
going from the little finger to the thumb and the thumb that holds the clarinet under the thumb rest, what would you say, Dr. Markison, that you'd, you have experienced in, in your professional uh, 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 clarinet and other instrument playing that uses the thumb as the instrument holding instrument or instru instrument holding finger, as well as um, usual uh, problems of the thumb um, involving, let's say, clarinet playing? What elements are there and how we can help that ailment? Well, yeah, a few things come to mind. First of all, the aging hand, uh, putting, putting it on a post, you're transferring a lot of load down to the thumb basal joint, and it's synonymous with carpometacarpal or trapeziometacarpal joint. So what that does, if you put one pound here, it's 2.5 pounds, five to seven pounds, 10 to 12 pounds here because there are nine poles, vectors of force going through this system to give us full human opposability, circumductibility. So the Rob Peter to pay Paul equation is simply, you don't have an intrinsically stable joint and then you're loading it on a post. So beware. So the first thing that can happen in the elders is wear and tear here, and then ultimately arthritis and then may need to reconstruct that joint. Fortunately, it, the operation works well, but be nice to avoid it. I practice physically light clarinets, and you, you, you won't like me for this, but I have some plastic clarinets that weigh 40% less, because I'm, I'm really not, I'm not wanting to strain this very much. And speaking of strain, as we're, as we're posting there, right thumb, it can strain the tendons. So one thing that happens is joint. One thing that can happen coincidentally or independently and earlier is a form of tendonitis called de Quervain's, which is tendons that have to go through a fiber and bone channel. And if they get inflamed and their envelopes called synovial envelopes get swollen, they have no place to go. And so it's very, very tight. And so Fritz de Quervain, who came from a very musical family in Switzerland, described people milking animals, goats and cows doing this, maybe not too much different from static loading here. And he said, well, you just release the tight areas of tendon. So I, I did a clarinetist and tuba player yesterday, by the way, just the same thing, but it was isolated de Quervain stenosing tenosynovitis, and it worked out very well. And he's happy, we're happy. I mean, that's, that's a tendon entrapment as opposed to a nerve entrapment. It's, it's rare to have other problems about the thumb, but one of them is called trigger thumb. And that's from sustained pressure here because you've got a single tendon going this way. Descriptive Greek, flexor pollicis longus, the long bender of the pollux thumb. And so it gets tight here, a little fiber band. And so did a painter, she's painting with brushes, big canvases yesterday. And so you just release that tight little ring on your local and then the thumb is free again. Trigger thumb. Trigger thumb, carpal metacarpal joint arthritis, de Quervain, rarely entrapment of a nerve called radial sensory nerve. That's pretty rare. But, you know, you're always looking for coincidence. And in the totally arthritic upper extremity, you may have wrist problems and so on. So well, the question is, what do you do? Uh, can you get an adjustable thumb rest? The answer, of course, you know, the, is the answer is yes. Can you use a neck strap if, it, if it's not too uncomfortable or a chest or neck, neck strap of some kind to unload the thumb? And that's a good idea. You just want to remember 10 to 12x force amplification from thumb pad here. And I, there was something we talked about before about why play softly. And I think there's a natural tendency to overdo the counter pressure on the back of the instrument when you're playing forcefully. It's just gripping for dear life. Whereas when you're pianissimo and under mezzo forte, you're more relaxed. Try it yourself. I mean, you can actually biofeedback without things hooked up to you and understand that, ooh, lay off the thumb. It's your friend. Don't hurt it. Absolutely. Uh, talking about biofeedback, actually, I have practiced many times the way that I'm not I'm, I'm sounding the clarinet. I'm just 
I'm, I'm just releasing air into the clarinet. I really want to see what I feel about myself kinesthetically, and it's a different, a completely different experience than having the actual clarinet sound and practicing it that way. Mm -hmm. I have one question. You mentioned releasing tension, uh, either tendon um, or, or muscle. Do you refer yeah. to the same ultrasound uh, a guided technique when you when you when you refer to releasing tensions on those areas of the hand and wrist? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. The youngest body part is the whole thumb mechanism. And this joint fell into final evolutionary form 50,000 years ago within our 200,000 years of homo sapienhood. So it's the youngest body part in evolution terms. And it's highly varied. The younger the body part, the greater the tendency towards variation. And so ultrasonography is great for carpal tunnel release and some other stuff. But uh, I often just have to take a look. You can have crisscrossing nerves and other things that might surprise you. And chance will favor the prepared surgical mind. And my bed night reading, bedtime reading is all about anatomical variation. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Markison, i um, wondering if you can talk a little bit about Depetren's um, condition. Hopefully I'm not mutilating the pronunciation on that. And um, a little bit more about it um, and treatments and preventions. Yeah, and, and as you may know, there's a fibrous matrix normally present in the hand to support the palm tissue because you want to reliably grip and hold objects. So this is tethered three-dimensionally to deeper structures. This stuff on top is loose. I don't know what it does. Maybe it just keeps the rain out. But this is loose. It's not tethered. This stuff works fine, usually for a lifetime. But in terms of heredity, the genome, the most common, uh, the most prevalent uh, dupetrons, which is bad behavior of the normally present fibrous matrix of support called palmar aponeurosis, is in Scandinavians, number one, number two, British Isles, number three, Western Europe, number four, Mediterranean. So what happens? You get little pretendinous cords, nodules that form, coalescing into cords with unidirectional pull. And so the contracture is downward that way. They used to call it the Pope's sign as in a blessing. And so it draws down typically ring and little, but it can affect all of them and it can affect the thumb web. And so what to do? In the early phase, you want to attend to any things that are also risk factors beyond heredity, alcoholism, cold hands, extreme nervous tension, uh, seizure disorders, because those, those are common pathways that feed into it. The operation of heavy vibrating tools, the water department jackhammer operators and so on who I see have workaday causes that are mechanical for that. And then if you have it, but it's mild, then do some gentle stretching, which, which is good, nothing self-punitive. Gentle stretching, keep the hands warm, massage with lotion or cream. Some people, if they have a guitar string-like pull that's very discreet and not tethered everywhere, can benefit from a little collagenase injection. And then a few days later, the, the cord kind of dissolves and you can straighten it. It doesn't solve the whole problem, but works well for knuckle joints, not so well for the middle PIP joints, but that can help. Sometimes little cortisone injections can help if it's an inflammatory thing. But uh, Baron Guillaume von Dupuytron in the early to mid 19th century is the guy who thought he described it, but it was really Sir Astley Cooper in London in 1822, who in his dissecting houses figured this thing out. Now it's not a guaranteed cure when you go in and you have to do a fasciectomy, remove the cords and bands, but I'm doing them every week or two, knowing that there's up to a 30% recurrence rate, and we just face it. But thank heaven, I've, I've been pretty lucky and probably had a 20% over the past 45 years of doing it. Dr. Markison, um, you mentioned cortisone injections, and I know um, those are those are pretty popular, but they're very controversial. What is your feeling on those? Well, okay, so what, is cort what does cortisone do? First of all, when you have inflammation, you have degranulation of little lysosomes, which are little packets of inflammatory stuff. And so uh, a steroid stabilizes a lysosomal 
membrane, so it cannot degranulate this reverberating inflammatory stuff. And then other cells pat patrolling the perimeter just eat it for lunch and inflammation quiets down. It doesn't necessarily mean healing, but can set the stage for healing. The art of steroid injection is one, just like William Tell, be accurate. Two, small dose, small but therapeutic dose. And so small doses that are not neglectful or withholding, but nonetheless uh, effective, that's fine. If you do it too often, then you can weaken tissues. I, again, am lucky because I've been very measured in, in the idea of giving injections. What would you say is the limit in terms of injections? I've heard some orthopedists say never more than twice in the same spot in a lifetime. And then I've heard other people say, you know, once a year. I've heard other people say once every six months. You know, I'm wondering what your feeling is on that. It really depends on where you're injecting. So if I have someone with end stage arthritis, but they're a symphony player and they've got to get through that last season and they're touring and DVD recordings, then they may come back every year and have an injection knowing that it's bone on bone rubbing and they'll eventually need reconstruction. If it's uh, Dupitrons, maybe once or twice. Uh, if it's a trigger finger, which we can talk about, clicking, snapping fingers that may lock up on you, twice, sometimes three times. But again, like Julia Child would say, season to taste. You know, sometimes you have to go beyond that a little bit, but you never want to inject into a tendon, into a nerve. And so it's really seeing the anatomy. And since I do ultrasonography at high resolution, I, I know where I am and uh, avoid little troubles. So when you say a couple of times, do you mean a couple of times over a lifetime or within a year or what would that be? No more often than, than six months apart, preferably a year apart. Okay, thanks. Um, my next question would be, um, we should talk a little bit about the Quarian tendon, uh, tendinosis. Uh, the strain of the um, uh, tendons, how prevalent it is among uh, musicians, wind players, maybe if you have any experience with clarinet players, and what are the symptoms, how we can treat it, or how we can prevent it? Yeah, good. And I, I, I spoke about it a little bit earlier, but again, maybe I could get graphic on my own hand here for a minute. And let's see if we can get this in the picture. All right, so you've got a couple of couple of tendons. They go through a little channel. One goes, one goes all the way. Let's see if we can get this to show up. One goes all the way up to there. Another one goes and stops short, inserting on the base of the thumb bone here. This this inserts on another bone that's up here. And so these fan out, so you have a geometric wedge or, or conical section. And if that's, if that's not enough, you've also got a lubricating sleeve called the synovial sheath. And so that gets swollen. And if that's not enough, and so you can see that that, that causes pain, localized, more pain, loading the wrist, sweeping across the hand, and radiating proximally as well inflammation drops the tissue pH, so you get nerves traversing over top of it that radiate the pain in either direction, the radial sensory nerve. And then, if that's not enough, 65% of the patients who ultimately require surgical release have a double-barreled first extensor compartment, meaning you've got to release the main tunnel and then subtunnels. Case in point, yesterday, a jewelry designer slash pianist who came in and she just wasn't crossing under. She was terribly happy, unhappy with it. And so ultrasonographically in the office, it was obvious she had a septated double barreled first compartment and that was obviously found at surgery and released. One of the failures of surgery for this stuff is, is not doing ultrasound and pre-thinking what if there's more than one tunnel. And so again, the multivaried body part called the hand or wrist or upper limb is something where you always got to think of anatomical variation. Anyway, what you do is you release it 
especially a guitarist, you want to be very careful. There's a ridge here called the radial ridge, a bone. And if you release it too far towards the palm side, the tendons are going to slip over that ridge. Very bad. So another good reason to have the patients under local. You do your little release staying towards the top side, have them move around. They don't want to, they don't need to watch. Some like to watch, you know, but it, for me, it doesn't matter. But you release it, you make sure they're free through a full range of wrist and thumb motion. Then you're done. 15 minutes later, the captive thumb is free again. I see. Would you say that uh, uh, this, uh, the query and ten, ten, ten denos, ten, ten denosis is localized to the wrist structure or can be found in any other finger structure? Well, I mean, the equivalent, the analog really is to have trigger fingers stenosing tenosynovitis, meaning tightness with inflammation. And so that would be trigger fingers. Uh, but also, and again, the same jewelry designer yesterday, uh, her diagnosis, first opinion was, it's just a queer veins. But she said, gee, I've got trouble doing this. I said, well, that can't be to queer veins only. And so she had stenosis of the second. There are six tunnels on top. You've got a carpal tunnel and an ulnar tunnel on the palm side, six tunnels on top. Her second tunnel was tight. So as I do beyond ultrasonography, I took the infant head of a pediatric stethoscope and listened to her tendons gliding on the affected hand and the normal non-symptomatic hand. Harsh, high-pitched sound, rubbing, obvious, and then ultrasound confirming swelling. And so she needed release here and release here. Now she's happy. Release of one would not have been adequate. Understand. Thank you. Is there? I have another follow-up question. Um, how bad? How painful is the pain coming from this ailment? Is that varying level, or that's usually the same amount of pain that we experience when we have this symptom? Well, it, it, the symptoms really vary, and you have to think of gestational to queer veins as well. And I've had a fair number of musicians, wind instruments, and otherwise, who've gone through pregnancy and had transient to queer veins, which affects 15% of pregnant women, usually around the second, maybe third uh, uh, trimester. And then it resolves 90% of the time, not needing any special treatment. But they have a great deal of trouble, not only during pregnancy, but nursing their child. So they need some counseling on how to hold and support the baby safely while nursing. Um, that's one category, but that was overlapping in her, a musical life uh, in parallel. But as far as localized pain, when you're going like this, you're going to have pain, and that pain may linger, and then sometimes it's sleep disturbing, as it was in yesterday's uh, surgical patient. So it's really highly variable, but it is pain that can radiate either direction. It's very disturbing. Thank you. Just for the sake of, of our um, viewership, I'm wondering if you can just clarify, Dr. Markison, the difference between the de Quervain's tendinosis and the de Quervain's ten tenosynovitis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I think they're probably the same thing on a spectrum. Uh, I really do think de Quervain, and when he described it uh, long ago, was, was just talking about a whole spectrum of mild occasional stuff, unto severe stuff that's a vicious cycle and so trapped and tight you have to release it. I don't, I don't see too much difference. Uh, I call it all the queer veins. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, my next question would uh, relate to the flexor and extensor tenosynovitis. Um, it's probably a little bit more painful than the de queer vein. Would you say that? Well, it can be. Yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of times, again, you have these six tunnels. The first is de queer vein. Second is the wrist extensors. Third is a busy superhighway where you've got your finger straighteners, extensors, and your proper extensor of the index. Okay, so that's the fourth compartment. The third, third compartment actually is the one that gives you thumb tip straightening. The fourth compartment is the one I'm talking about. This very busy index pointer, which is indices proprius, plus these. And then the fifth is a single compartment for the straightener of the little, and the sixth gets your wrist bent back that way. Any of them can be stenotic, and it really varies depending on what you're trying to do, the instrument at hand, and so on. But this is so busy that if you have tenosynovitis there, 
it can be very troublesome, and that's the nature of modern computing, for example. Patients will come in with relatively diffuse hand and wrist pain, and often not surgical, and may respond to rest, occasionally splinting, or anti-inflammatories, or a tiny dose injection. Um, since you mentioned computing, um, do you know anything about the Tony keyboard? Yeah, the, the yeah, what Tony Hodges, you mean the Tony Hodges keyboard, yeah, what he yes. came out with and unfortunately did not go into production. And he approached me with it without any financial piece of it on my part. But it was a continuously adjustable split split and tilt keyboard. And so instead of being here, which is really not a good way to put your hands, because all of evolution got us free-handed bipedal. And so as soon as you go like that, you start to stretch and twist things. And there's a curve called the Blix curve that governs the activity of muscle in the periphery. So that if you stretch a muscle, you fail under load of, or weakness. If you shorten a muscle, you fail under load uh, or repetition. And so you want to use them at proper fiber lengths. And so if, if you untwist, have a split and tilt continuously adjustable keyboard, that helps. If you're doing anything short of writing computer code, then you should be using voice recognition software uh, supplemented by the use of foot pedals. And so anybody doing numbers and words, alphanumeric data, the, in my practice, they go to voice recognition, even if English is a fair second language. If you have a good quality microphone, and I just use a wireless mic, um, then you're better off than trying to hunt and pack. So I'd say 95% of all my words and numbers are, are voice. Understand. Thank you very much. Uh, so going back a little bit to the flexoring sensor tenosynovitis, what are some of the tr uh, uh, um, uh, prevention that we as, as musicians or clarinetists can do to avoid those? Uh, okay, good. Well, partly it's the mechanism of use because thematically in, in hand or any surgery, it's form, function, fit, and failure avoidance. And in that failure avoidance, you've got not only ergonomics and avoiding twist, which is going to make things fail under load or repetition, but uh, lighter, physically lighter instruments, a parallel interface that's small. I mean, some of my patients, even though they, they may not like the pitch of an E-flat clarinet, it keeps them in shape. They're obviously in a different key, but so be it. Physically light instruments, a very light touch on the instrument, never working hard. You really never want to see yourself or have them see you sweat when you're playing. Uh, beyond that, good hydration, good breathing. I've had a number of patients who've had aches and pains, often body-wide, who've gone into CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. I send them for a sleep study. Turns out they're not oxygenating brain or body at night. And then they get this little positive pressure, either a mask or the nasal uh, pillows. And then they're suddenly fresh and a lot of aches and pains go. So they lived a life where eight hours of a 24-hour cycle were hypoxic, deoxygenated. And so oxygen matters, hydration matters, keeping your hands warm, incredibly important. And in the office, I, I teach people autogenic relaxation to hand, warm their hands, but also use wireless biofeedback, to monitor temperature with a screen metaphor of keep the car on the road or make the waterfall flow and that sort of thing, which is simple autogenic training to make sure they can be warm. You're not fit to play if your hands are cold. Now, if you just need exposed pads of fingers and thumbs, then you wear fingerless gloves and check your temperature. If the hands are warm, you're ready to go. If they're not, you're either dehydrated, environmentally cold exposed, nervous, or all three. Because microcirculation matters and you want to self-proclaim you as a warm-blooded mammal all the time. Never play cold-handed. And then the other thing is the, the whole universe of our three trillion cells with 86 billion in the brain living in its own metabolic, nutritional, and endocrine environment. So you have to kind of be a micro and macro environmentalist to think, is that patient's thyroid out of whack and that's why they've got hand pain? Do they have diabetes out of control? Is that why the hands may be stiff or triggering? Do they have vitamin D deficiency? Do they have other vitamin or trace element deficiencies? Do they have a single drug they're taking or polypharmacy with negative drug interactions coming out in, in a diathesis of hand trouble. 
So yes, the little little part of it is what do you do? How do you do it? Next level, how's the rest of you? And so you have to be in a way a real doctor, but even in a lay sense without an MD, it's a good idea to think broadly as you as you think locally in terms of hand function. Thank you for these thoughts. How important would you say, Dr. Markison, is the diet in prevention and treatment of repetitive strain injuries? I know you mentioned vitamin D and certain nutritional deficiencies, but can you talk a little bit uh, more about how important what we eat or what we don't eat, um, how that can affect us as musicians? Yeah, absolutely right. And I you know, I may seem a stodgy in a, a way, but for me, especially as a surgeon, there's no room for alcohol in my life because it's a neurotoxin. Uh, besides losing friends and family over it, uh, it's just, it's not a great idea because you dehydrate yourself. It targets a lot of tissues, including brain, and it's not a great way to age. I'm not saying you have to be fully abstinent, but for me, there's no place for it. Uh, if you can cut it out or just ration it and every volume of alcohol chased down with two equal volumes of water, you're at least diluting it a little bit. But far below the legal intoxication limit, you can have tissue trouble that may not reverse. The other thing is, and Hippocrates was the genius, let's face it, he lived 460 to 375 BC. Food is fuel, food is medicine. We became agrarian in the past 20,000 years, cultivating wheat. The problem with wheat is it's a lectin. What do lectins do? They break down the intercellular junctions between cells of the intestine, and you leak out inflammatory mediators, and they hit the weak targets, brain and body. And so if you can go wheat-free or at least gluten-free as much of the time as you can, tough to do during holidays and feasts, but you'll, you'll be much better. The less grain you have, the better you will be. The less lectin content less consequential weakening and leaky gut syndrome. That's really true. The other thing is, and I, begin, I began 40 years ago to see life and nutrition as a big salad. You have a moist body, 50 to 55% water, mostly moist goods, avoiding dry goods whenever possible. I don't wanna have some net loss where I have to take all of my vasculature and feed brain and body core sacrificing hands. So I eat a basically moist diet, tons of fresh produce, not the sweet stuff. And I, I do eat animal protein and that's fine, not to an excess. But then we get to what is the other side of integrity in the body besides a good nutrient stream, a moist diet, alcohol abstinence, grain limitation, and it's probiotics. And probiotics are important because the human microbiome is your friendly population of bacteria, mostly in the intestine, all the way from the oral flora to the far end. And so maintaining your microbiome is incredibly important to avoid inflammation, wear and tear, premature aging, total body failure. 60 to 80% of immunity is happening around the circumference of your 20 plus feet of intestine. If your immunity fails, you're not only prone to COVID, you're prone to early demise. And so that's important. My probiotics, and a good probiotic has 50 to 100 billion colony forming units and at least 10 strains of bacteria. And they're not expensive. You just take one capsule a day, good to go. The other thing you mentioned is vitamin D. Vitamin D is so important, it shouldn't be called a vitamin. It's really a hormone. When they rolled out the human genome in the year 2000, 20,050 genes, they later learned a thousand are co-regulated by vitamin D. If you want to fully decode your genetic code, you never want to be D deficient. Laboratories inappropriately describe 30 nanograms per ml as the lower limit of quote, normal. That's not true. The rheumatology literature, you want to have your blood hydroxy vitamin D levels in the ideal range of 40 to 80 nanograms per ml. In this age of COVID and potential future plagues, every single immune cell, T and B cells, have D receptors. If you're D deficient for days or weeks, you're at risk. And almost everyone who's perished from COVID 
in addition to comorbid factors, has been D deficient. Now, 50 to 75 percent of indoor dwelling Americans and somewhat around the world as well have blood measurable D deficiency. Going out in the all together all day will get you somewhere, but it's not enough. Liquid D3 is well absorbed and capsules and gel caps are poorly absorbed. Most of my patients are taking between 2,000 and 5,000 international units of D daily, translating to two to five drops of liquid D. And then the, the other thing is drugs. And if you're taking a drug that you may not need, discuss it without rancor with a prescribing physician and ask why. You take statin medication for cholesterol control, but 25 to 33% of patients have intolerable, usually musculoskeletal effects, side effects from statins. They change their diet gluten-free and take some liquid CoQ10. Then they often get their numbers better and they live happier without statin side effects. What does the CoQ10 do? Okay, so again, without financial interest, and here's my daily dose, an unscientific swig, which I know to be 200 to 300 milligrams. Fantastic. Okay, here's the point. You want your blood CoQ10 levels to be in the ideal 0.8 to 1.4 range. CoQ10 is the rate-limiting coenzyme en route to producing all the energy in the body, yuan, euro, dollars worth of energy. What does that mean? In order to make ATP, which is the currency of energy, you have to have CoQ10. After age 40, there's a blood measurable rundown in CoQ10 levels. CoQ10 is working in the wonderful organelle called the mitochondrion. That's your power plant, bioenergetics. 25% of your three trillion cells, 86 billion brain cells, depending on your mitochondria to work away and make ATP and metabolized drugs and a separate part of that to fuel the whole body. And so you never want to run low on CoQ10. And I have indeed taken it every day for decades and feel better for it. Okay, thank you. Um, I have I have two questions. Um, as we were talking about um, vitamin absorption in pill as well as in liquid form, how would you say the body recognizes or does not recognize um, those vitamins that we might absorb or take in? Well, it seems like the B vitamins, B vitamins are a little more sturdy and they have a longer segment of intestine ready to absorb them. But D, vitamin D often gets inactivated by stomach acid um, early and a, a small segment of intestine absorbing it. And so the studies have shown if you really want to maintain your D levels, you take liquid D. It probably doesn't matter for vitamin B6. B12 does matter in terms of all you need is 2,500 micrograms sublingual, let it dissolve under the tongue. Very nice, quick delivery. 2,500 micrograms every two weeks is really what you need in B12. And so that's important. Um, but you see, take a stomach acid blocker like Prilosec, Omeprazole, other acid blockers, proton pump inhibitors, they inhibit the absorption of all vitamins. So many of my severely D deficient, very symptomatic inflamed patients are taking acid blockers. Their patents expired years ago, so you get them over the counter, you abuse them, and then you end up with poor multivitamin absorption and consequent inflammation. I understand. Thank you very much. Um, I know this this was, this is a little excursion, but you talked about um, uh, grain and that we should avoid um, uh, grains. What types of grain do we talk about and and how much should be taken or should not at all? Well, again, you know, they, this is being argued, but the fact is, Perlmutter in 2013 wrote Grain Brain, and he talked about the perils of grain in terms of grain. There are a lot of Alzheimer's patients who don't necessarily bounce back, but they're gluten, meaning grain, wheat-free. But as far as the other grains, some are safer. You know, the Minoans were the ones to cultivate quinoa 20,000 plus years ago. That seems to be pretty bulletproof and doesn't hurt you badly but it's the wheat-containing uh, grains that are potential trouble. 
And so if you really want to look not only at grains, but beyond, think of the category of molecules called lectins, L-E-C-T-I-N. And then look on the internet for a list of low lectin content foods. And again, those are the best foods because you have the least chance of causing leakage from the gut. Thank you. Barley is barley is so so. Rye is a little trouble. Spelt is probably okay. These are unusual grains people don't like anyway. Absolutely. Thank you. But rice is okay. Rice is okay. Rice is okay, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the, the, if you really look at human metabolism, we were more into protein and fat than carbohydrate because you can make sugar out of just about anything. And so test yourself. Have some very, very low carbohydrate laden meals and see how you feel for a week. Then go back to adding starch and then see how you feel. See, as a, a person who really depends on my memory, and when I was an aspiring jazz musician, I was told by my Cousin Tommy, a genius pianist, you know, he said, don't come back for a second lesson until you know a thousand jazz standards in 12 keys. I said, Tommy, that's 10 years. He said, that's right. See you then. And so then the question is, how do you maintain memory? The worst thing in the world for me is to look at sheets of paper with notes on it. I've, I've tried to memorize everything uh, that I can so that I could communicate the information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can we just end the meeting and come back since we have uh, three more? Um, the carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar tunnel, and radial tunnel syndrome we talk about, and I don't think it was fit in four minutes. If you can just uh, uh, really just end the meeting because it's going to shut down after one hour. I started exactly sure. at 11 o'clock my time. Yeah? Yeah, thank absolutely. You. Yeah, no, listen, you've, you've kindly asked about carpal tunnel and other peripheral entrapment neuropathy. One thing that hand surgeons should do, and they actually do do, is they think about the neck. Could you have cervical spine problems with nerves radiating pain masquerading as a peripheral nerve entrapment? Answer, yes. They can coexist or be the primary cause. Could you have brachial plexus, this super highway of nerves running behind the collarbone? Yes, of course you can. Then we get out to the periphery. But before you do, you could be in the arm, elbow, forearm. But let's go out to the periphery for a moment, just for economy of time. The carpal tunnel is where the median nerve, like a median strip on a highway, runs down the middle, goes under a fiber band like tough gristle on meat. And so very tough with a bony arch in the back. And so what that means, I don't know if I have a little sketch or something. I do, just by coincidence. All right, so here we are. Okay, so here's a cross section of the wrist, okay? Now, my fingertip is right on the median nerve. This is a bony arch behind. Median nerve, you've got nine tendons, one for thumb, two for digit, busy highway. That nerve, if troubled, will cause numbness and tingling, thumb index, middle, and half of ring may awaken you from sleep at night, carpal tunnel syndrome. And so that's one of them. The other is ulnar tunnel syndrome. And the ulnar, ulnar nerve is superficial, meaning here's a carpal tunnel with a nerve vulnerable, nine tendons gliding near it. The ulnar nerve is above. If you have ulnar tunnel syndrome, numbness and tingling, little finger and the other half of ring finger over without weakness of the small muscles. This serves 15 out of 20 small muscles. Now, the other is radial tunnel syndrome. And so, I don't think I have a quick shot of that, but suffice to say, radial nerve makes all these things straighten out the wrist and fingers can be pinched here, here, in in the forearm, over here. But it serves all these wonderful muscles that give you this stuff. And so that's radial tunnel syndrome. In a bad case, you can have a wrist drop, you can have the fingers drop, 
And so there are multiple levels of potential entrapment of the radial nerve here. It would be rare to have radial nerve pinching of the sensory branch called Wartenberg syndrome, but you can get it. Then you have a lot of pain here without weakness. But it can overlap and coincide with de Quervain's in that region. That's the quick tour. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a concluding um, thought, I'm I'm curious if you can just tell us how many musicians you've treated over the past um, decades in your practice, because that's probably a staggering number. It's many thousands. It, it's just many thousands. Look, I love the musical hand. And you know, you're at zero gravity when you're flying along in music, no matter what the idiom. I, it's just thousands. And uh, my, my oath to self and others was just give back and keep the music going. And sadly, it's left the school. 90% of kids start, stop. And that's terribly sad. And so I think it's incredibly important. And so thousands and thousands. <laughs>